Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to a subsurface session. We have four room, rooms running in parallel, all with very interest, interesting presentations, and uh, so feel free to move between rooms. At the end of each presentation, there will be a question and answer session. You can make questions uh, during the presentation in the Q&A chat that you can find in the right side of your screen with the question mark icon. As a chairperson of this session, we will have Teresa Martins. Teresa is currently a senior data scientist at the Geophysical Studies team within Geosolutions at GALP ENP. She started working in the oil industry in GALP in 2005 until 2009 in the geophysical team, giving support to seismic acquisitions and processing work mainly in Brazil, Timor, and Angola assets. During this time, had one year experience in onshore fields and offshore experience in Brazil assets. Since June 2009, started to focus on key AI studies, giving support to new ventures, exploration and reservoir geology teams. Teresa holds a master degree in geophysical sciences and a postgraduate degree in engineering and science of the earth from Faculty of Science of Lisbon University. Please welcome Teresa and the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Rita. So, hello, everybody. Uh, hope all of you are safe and enjoy the, the next four presentations. Uh, I will introduce the, our first uh, uh, speaker. So, it's Gil Machado. Gil Machado is a petroleum geologist and stratigrapher from Chrono Surveys. Gil holds a degree in geology and a PhD in stratigraphy and petroleum geology. He has 10 years of experience in the petroleum industry in the exploration process of Oman, Mozambique, Brazil, Angola, among others. He's an advanced seismic interpreter and uh, has worked with sediment fairways identification, deep water sedimentation characterization, sequence stratigraphy, well correlation, and prospect generation and risking. Worked in PDO as a stratigrapher, where among other subjects contributed to the best biostratigraphic zonation review of the subsurface of Oman. Gil is affiliated with some associations, for example, EAGE, and is a founding member of the Portuguese Association of Geoscientists and Engineers. Gil is currently heading a geological consulting company, the Chrono Service, providing services and training in petroleum geology. Gil will present today evaporate Evaporate biostratigraphy, turning salt from a drilling gather to a source of data. Welcome, Gilles, and uh, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, uh, Rita and Teresa, for the introductions. Welcome. And thank you, Galp, for uh, once again organizing this very interesting meeting. So today I am presenting some uh, R&D work that we've been developing in Chrono Surveys, which has been matured or in, during the past year, and has now been uh, being offered as a commercial service to uh, to clients around the world. Uh, I'm going to talk about evaporites in uh, general, or as you probably know them in the industry as salt. Gen generally, we talk about salt, and we know salt is a, a common uh, uh, has common presence in petroleum systems around the world. So there are many petroleum provinces, and this is a map, and there are several others, showing here in red all the uh, basins, sedimentary basins, which contain considerable amounts of salt. Salt is frequently associated also with petroleum geology, so it's a very important component of the petroleum system, and we'll see how uh, it can impact uh, uh, petroleum systems. And then in practical terms, how it also impacts uh, the way we drill wells, we shoot seismic and so forth. And of course, how can biostratigraphy, the little fossils we find, can help uh, with tackling uh, the salt. So, as I was mentioning, uh, in sedimentary basins, the presence of salt is usually related with the formation of traps for oil and gas. This is a, a cartoonish example of a salt diapir which uh, frequently forms uh, uh, hydrocarbon traps, either above the salt as anticlines, fault-related uh, salt -related faults, which can also form uh, um, traps for hydrocarbons, pinch-outs against the salt, all sorts of different types of, uh, of stratigraphic and structural traps that can, uh, can hold hydrocarbons. So it's very relevant 
for the petroleum industry. So for the mining industry, both halite and sulfite and other minerals, which are frequently formed here at the cap rock, when, especially when these appears uh, are close to the surface and you start having um, the influence of meteoric water reacting with the salts and precipitating other types of minerals. It's also very important for other industries because uh, of its characteristics, because it's uh, uh, impermeable and it's quite uh, has very uh, different physical properties when compared with other rocks. You can actually uh, um, produce salt caverns, so man-made caverns within salt bodies, which can be used to store gas, so as strategic reserves for many uh, countries around the world, and more recently also to store hydrogen and CO2. So it's, um, it's a very important resource, not just for the extractive industries, but also as uh, uh, strategic uh, storage of gas, and more recently for uh, um, the industry more related with renewable energies and other types of uh, energy storage. Because of the same physical properties, it can also be used, the same types of, of caverns can be used as a reservoir for hazardous or nuclear waste. So it, it can store these types of residues within salt bodies, you can seal them and you can, they can be held there for well, eternity, basically. Salt also has a very dif different thermal conductivity compared with other rocks. So it can be two to four times higher than that of other rocks. The effect is a reduction of temperatures in the areas uh, below the salts and an increase of uh, the temperature above and around the salt. So again, this is very important when you're modeling the thermal history of a basin for petroleum geology. And of course, for geothermal uh, industry, which is now growing more and more, it also, of course, has lots of implications because this, this uh, presence of salt bodies may be very relevant to, um, to where you drill your geothermal wells and where you uh, uh, start producing uh, geothermal energy. It's not all good, so there's some problems with salt, uh, and geophysicists know this quite well, and uh, any geoscientist working with seismic where salt is present. So again, because of its physical properties, you get a lot of the seismic energy when, it, when you're shooting seismic, which is reflected by um, especially the top of salt and also sometimes the lateral uh, uh, limits of the salt bodies. Much of the energy of the acoustic waves are reflected, so you don't get much energy going below the salt. So when you're trying to image below the salt, for example, like the basalt of Brazil, then frequently you need more advanced seismic techniques like wide azimuth and other uh, types of techniques that can allow that allow uh, the uh, subsalt strata to be imaged by by uh, by this technique. So it's a uh, uh, it's a two-edged sword, let's say, that, of course, you like to have salt in your sedimentary basins. It, it promotes uh, usually the salt, uh, the forming of salt accumulations, but it's also a, a considerable problem when you try to image uh, the subsurface using seismic acquisition. It's also a problem when you try to drill. So some of these problems are shared with other types of rock, but uh, salt is particularly relevant because of reactive shales. Uh, frequently have intermediate shells with, with salt, with uh, other evaporites, which can create backhoff. You can have well bore erosion and instability, different solubility of the different types of evaporites. So you, you may need to adjust the, the, mud, the drilling mud chemistry quite often to compensate for that. Problems with excessive torque caused by salt creep. So salt can continue to move in a human time scale, so with, within uh, uh, days, weeks, or months, you can have salt movement deforming your wells. So that's a, a, a real problem in many places around the world. And that generates well control issues. Uh, you can have significant pressure gradients between the salt and the subsalt strata. So any type of information you can have about the salt and what you're going to encounter while you're drilling the salt section and what you're going to encounter after you exit the salt section will be relevant to um, to your drilling, um, uh, to the way you drill your wells, and also, of course, or broadly, to the way you understand the petroleum system of the area you're exploring. 
So how can biostratigraphy help? So we, we've seen this is uh, there are geological and technical problems. How can little microfossils help? So what we do as biostratigraphers, commercial biostratigraphers, is that we work with these microfossils contained in rock in rocks, and they provide sedimentation ages. Uh, so you, we know when these rocks were formed in terms of millions of years. We can also have an idea of the depositional environment. If these rocks were deposited in terrestrial environments, in shallow marine, coastal, deep marine, etc. In rig sites, biostratigraphy is commonly used for TD calls. So frequently there is a stratigraphic uh, tie to the, to the formation where we should stop drilling. And frequently that is uh, um, interpreted by the biostratigrapher who can be uh, at the well site. Same for casing points. And when you're drilling deviated wells, you can do geosteering, but very often biostratigraphy can also help, and that's called biosteering. I'll show you uh, how that works in the next slide. In more long-term uh, work, so it, not, at, not at the well sites, but if you get uh, well samples and you have them for uh, different wells and you're doing more regional, uh, more extensive work, uh, those uh, the microfossils can be used to calibrate seismic interpretation, so you can define your well tops and with that your well markers. You can do the well correlation based on the information given by biostratigraphy. You can assess thermal maturation, especially if you're working with organic well microfossils, so they are sensitive to temperature changes over geological time periods, So and they will change color because of that, so you can assess the thermal maturation of your microfossils. And then you can go from reservoir scale studies to basin-wide studies uh, using biostratigrapher and, of course, usually associated with other disciplines, geochemistry, sedimentology, and so forth. One major limitation so far of biostratigraphy is that it is usually restricted to non-evaporitic rocks. So you usually use them in shells, uh, limestones, other types of rock, but to the best of my knowledge, it hasn't been used commercially for evaporitic rocks. So this is how biosteering works. So you have different strata of rock. Each strata will have different fossil assemblages, microfossil assemblages. If you drill a well, if it's a vertical well, then the biostratigrapher can give you real-time information as the cuttings reach the surface. He can analyze them in real time and tell you which age of the rock or which formation you are. And that can be used to give uh, casing points or TD calls. If you're drilling deviated wells, then you can use biosteering. So in this example, we want to keep on this uh, grayish layer, which has a specific fossil assemblage. And again, real time, the uh, biostratigrapher can give you uh, can give drillers information if you're drilling through the right uh, path. If you go through a fault, for example, he can tell you you're too high up. You're in the layer above, you need to go down, and then you start, the bicycle starts seeing this assemblage again, and he says, okay, you're there, keep it in the same layer, and so forth. So this is, in a nutshell, how biosteering works. So how can this be used for evaporitic rocks? So how is it useful to drill through salt? How can biostratigraphy help? Well, the first question we should pose is, can fossils be preserved in evaporitic sediments? And the answer, yes, they can. So this is a very simplistic model where we have a salt lake. This is the Dead Sea, the current day Dead Sea. But there are many examples in the geological past where it's had salt deposition. It's a basically a hypersaline uh, lake where salt uh, and uh, halite and other uh, minerals are actively precipitating. But not just that is being deposited. So you have spores and pollen from any nearby vegetation, which are being transported into the lake, in addition to clays and silts by river and inputs or just blown in by wind. And for example, if you have any connection with the sea, you can have marine algae coming in, and they can also be preserved uh, as microfossils within uh, the evaporitic sediments and also the interbedded shales and other sediments that are frequently encountered in evaporitic sequences. So we'll be looking for these impurities in the salts which are mostly clays and silt, but they will also contain these microfossils. So I started this by searching for 
existing literature on salt by stratigrapher, uh, it amounts to a few dozens. And if we limit that to um, uh, commercial uh, biostratigraphy or, or at least apply to the petroleum industry, petroleum geology, the number is even less than that. So it's it's really, uh, I have to say for me, puzzling that this technique hasn't been used more uh, widely. One of the uh, just possible justifications is that the, the way you, you process the samples to observe the microfossils is considerably different from the normal uh, samples. So many samples that may have been considered to be barren, so not containing any microfossils, simply because they were not processed the right way. So the recovery of microfossils and vitrinite, we'll see what it is, from evaporites and associated sediments will depend, of course, on the original fossil content. That's common to any rock. You need to have fossils in order to observe them. Uh, but we've seen from experience that they are frequently there. And then uh, we, of course, need to have a sound preparation method. So we know we need to know how to process the samples to extract those microfossils. If we try to process the samples the same way we do with other types of samples, we'll, we'll just fail. And that was our experience. We, we started using the similar methods and it simply doesn't work. So we've been working with polynology, so organic walled microfossils. And our results have shown that we only need a few grams of samples, usually uh, 100 grams, and so cuttings are suitable, uh, different types of sample, samples are suitable, and the most common ones are cuttings, and they are can be used for this type of analysis. And with other, as with other uh, types of samples, it provides information on depositional age, polyenvironment, and also thermal maturation. We'll see how that works. So we've refined the method and we have now a success rate which is uh, equivalent or comparable with non-evaporitic sediments. So it's basically the uh, uh, practical terms, it's the same thing using uh, biostratigraphy with evaporites or with other types of samples. I'll show you some examples, some of the case studies that uh, we use to refine this method. We started by taking samples from the Lule salt mine in southern Portugal. Uh, it's an early Jurassic mobile salt, so it's a diapir, which is very close to the surface. The, the mine has been working now for several decades. And in addition to the, this dirty halide, so it's a halide with a lot of impurities, and there are other um, uh, types of uh, rocks which are interbedded with the, with the salt. So the, this dolomitic fillstone, churchy gypsum, and organic rich shales. We sampled all of those to obtain uh, significant results from the dolomitic silson, but all the other ones uh, proved to be productive and we obtained in this case many spores and pollen. And we also found uh, phytoclasts. So phytoclasts are basically little pieces of wood. They are also called, depending how you observe them, they are also called vitrinite. And vitrinite is, the, let's say, the standard method used to uh, determine thermal maturity of sedimentary rocks. So you can uh, determine a, a number, uh, a, a temperature, paleo peak temperatures that the rocks were exposed to. So this technique also allows to extract this phytoplast or this vitrinite to do the thermal mat mat maturation assessment. So this was a, an add-on, unexpected but very welcome add-on uh, to, the, to the work we, we've been doing. The second uh, case study we work with is this Sous salt mine in uh, Morocco. This is a, a similar uh, stratigraphy, so late Jurassic to early Jurassic mobile salts. In this case, non-mobile salts, sorry. Uh, and it's an underground mine. Uh, and we, we have access to several lithotypes uh, um, from a core which was drilled in this, uh, in this mine. All the samples were positive, so different types of, uh, of, of rocks, shales, different types of halides, more brown, black, pinkish uh, halides, all of them produced spores and pollen. So again, results were positive, and again, we also found these phytoplasts, also known as vitrinites. Third example we, uh, we worked with was this uh, Velitska salt mine, so it's, it's very famous for touristic uh, reasons, it's now you can visit and there are these uh, beautiful salt uh, uh, caves, which are sculpted by the miners. I was lucky enough to visit the, the mine with local geologists. They took us uh, around the non-touristic part, and I was able to sample 
some of the um, some of the uh, several types of rocks. And again, we sampled different types of uprights, blackish halite, granular brown halite, and interbedded shells. And again, we found uh, these uh, microfossils, so pollen grain, dinoflagellates, and again, the phytoclasts. In this case, it's, a, it's also a diapir, but the age is considerably different. This is Miocene in age. But again, the, the results were very, very positive. Since then, we've tested also other two um, areas. So the Klodava salt mine in central Poland. So it's basically a Zechstein salt of Permian age. Again, different types of lithologies, uh, and most of them were productive. So the lomites were a bit difficult, but that, that's a commonly known fact for polynologists. And this, the, the image here is a, a gypsum quarry in central Por, uh, Portugal, and we sampled the gypsum, so other different types of rubrites, and again, the results were positive. So some of the conclusions is that these adapted processing techniques is now standardized and the success rate is similar to non-evaporatic samples. So we need to know what we're doing. We need to select the correct types of uh, lithologies, but then the success rate is considerably high. Productive sample characteristics, crystal size, color, we, we took note of all of that. We now understand better uh, the characteristics that the sample should have. So we can aim even rate, so close to 100%. We've analyzed samples from different ages, different geological settings, different thermal maturations, and all of them we were able to obtain positive results. So this can, in theory, be applied to any salt around the world. And also can be applied to different types of samples. So we've tested well samples, mine and outcrop, and all of them were productive. And this uh, nice add-on of uh, having phytoplasts, so this feature night that allows quantified determination of thermal maturity. So we know the uh, peak temperatures the rocks were exposed to. This is just an example of a possible application. So this is an example of the pre-salt of Brazil. In this case, it, the, the salt is mobile, but it's still stratified. So it contains different types of evaporites. A light gypsum and it writes uh, another more exotic uh, evaporite mineralogies and also sediments. So there's some shells and silsons interbedded with these, um, within this evaporitic sequence. So in this case, although the, the Santos and Campos Basin in Brazil are now quite well known in terms of geology, there's some, still some uh, doubts on the stratigraphy and the thermal evolution of the basin. So. This is one of the areas where I think, uh, I believe, salt by stratigraphy would be extremely useful to understand a bit deeper uh, uh, the geology of the area. And this is just an example. So uh, uh, for the in Brazil, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's almost finished, right? Yeah, yeah. wrapping okay. up. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, good. So post salt strata, you can use normal stratigraphy, by stratigraphy, and this is known now for for uh, many wells. But then you're basically blind in this this whole section of um, of the salt, and then even uh, below the the um, in the reservoirs themselves, the by stratigraphy is quite poor. So I believe there's still a lot to do uh, in uh, salt by stratigraphy and also the stratigraphy of the pre salt. Uh, that can still be explored. And this is just an example. There are many salt basins around the world where I believe this would be very useful. Uh, this was published recently in GeoX Pro and it's freely available. If you want to read a bit more about it, then I'm happy to um, continue this conversation after this talk is over. But this is also available if you Google for this salt by stratigraphy, GeoX Pro, you'll, find, you'll probably find this article. So that's it for me. I think we can go for Q&A. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Really nice presentation. Uh, I have a, a, a pair of, of questions. So first, could biostratigraphy on six salt layers and bodies allow to reconstruct or understand allokinetics of regional strata? Uh, it's a difficult question. So when you have, for example, still layered strata, like in this example, Mm -hmm. of the pre of the of Campos and Santos Basin in Brazil, then yes, because the stratigraphy is still preserved. So you can analyze in a regular in for example, and you can you can interpret the stratigraphy, the sedimentation environments, uh, the thermal maturity, whatever information you can get from it. 
if the if the dye appear is completely meshed up internally, so you don't have uh, any uh, um, preservation of the original stratigraphy, it gets a bit more complicated to to reconstruct the uh, the sedimentation environments and also the age. But you can still work with with the sample, so it's. Uh, the samples can also be worked, then the interpretation can be a bit more complicated than uh, in this example where you have still layered uh, salt stratigraphy. But yes, uh, the, the, the generic answer to that is yes, then the interpretation can be a bit more complicated. Very good. Uh, I think we have still time to do one or more. So second, in an industry driven by cost, can necessity for data collection affect drilling times and how can the importance of this data coexist with the necessity of drilling salt as fast as possible? Yeah, that's a very good question. So one of the ways that people use to uh, avoid most of those problems is just to drill fast through the salt. Yeah. Still, they have problems, for example, when they are exiting the salt. Frequently, seismic quality is not good enough to understand exactly where you're going to exit the salt. So if you knew the stratigraphy of the salt and you're having real-time uh, information about the, the stratigraphy, the base stratigraphy stratigrapher would probably be able to tell you you're, you're close to the base of salts, you're about to enter the pre-salt. So, so that, that's the type of uh, information that could be uh, used uh, for uh, real uh, drilling situations. And then there are many others depending on, on the specific situations. Okay. Uh, last one, have such salt biostrat studies already been done in Santos Basin? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no. Uh, they haven't been uh, done. Uh, I know that the pre-salt, they, they've tried to work out the, the biostratigraphy. It's not that easy. The fishes are not very easy to work with. But the salt itself, uh, as far as I know, uh, it has not been worked. Maybe, maybe there's something done now. But uh, my challenge now is not just commercially to promote this, but also even academic studies. This hasn't been explored by, by researchers around the world. There are a few universities that now start to work with this, but this is basically new ground to be explored. Okay. Okay, Gil, that's it. Thank you very much for, uh, Thank you. for being here to present a really interesting um, uh, subject. And uh, let's see. <laughs> okay. Thank you Thank very you much, Teresa. Much. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, Gio. So, yeah. so we next speaker will be Sergi Sertosimo. Let's just wait uh, uh, two or three minutes more to, to wait for him. Thank you. Hola, Teresa. Hello, Sergio. So, Sergio, is here already? Yeah, we are seeing your presentation. Yes, we are. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sergio. Thank so, you. I will present. Yeah, I will present Sergio. Sergio Sertosim is the head of geophysical studies group and the technical team leading research projects uh, here in GALP. Sergio is currently working in uh, an innovator project of artificial intelligence in the oil and gas industry. In the past, worked in several companies like uh, YPF Technology as a geophysical product champion for ENP department, YPF oil company in reservoir department as a technical advisor. Sergio worked in non conventional seismic data in Loma La Lata field, shale and gas, oil and tight gas in Petrobras Energia in Exploration Department as a technical advisor for AVO and trace inversion processing and analysis, data interpretation and processing supervision. He worked in Plus Petrol in Exploration Department in the geophysical operations and in geophysical studies. Sergio started in Western Geophysical in Seismic Data Processing with Marine and Land Data. data. Sorry. Today, Sergio will present another way to see and interact with the seismic data and geological concepts. Uh, welcome, Sergio, and uh, go ahead, please. 
Okay, thank you very much, Teresa, and thank you very much for all of you to participate in this conversation, this presentation. Basically, what I'm going to do is present some um, compare interpretation between the traditional interpretation and way and some uh, 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 novel way to interpret the data based on um, a, a new platform that we create with IBM. Um, so to do that, let's go to start about the data. So when we're talking about the seismic data, we're talking about the seismic data acquisition, seismic data processing, seismic interpretation, special studies. Seismic data acquisition and seismic data processing are very, very important for interpreters. The interpreters should know what we are going to do in acquisition and data processing. But today we are going to focus in, in these two, seismic interpretation and spatial studies. And then, at the end, I'm going to show you a real case with our uh, system. The system that we create with, uh, with IBM names SIA, so Surface Intelligent Advisors. And it's divided in, in three parts. One part is uh, SFA, or Seismic Facial Analysis, PPC, or Physical Property Characterization, or GRA, Geological Risk Assessment. The two last we are going to forget. The two last is going to be in another conversation. So we're going to focus in, in SFA, Seismic Facial Analysis. Normally, the interpreters start with a seismic cube or with a 2D lens. The first thing that they, we are going to do in the oil industry are interpret the faults. Then we are going to interpret the fault for every single line or every two lines or every three lines in the whole cube or in the 2D. After that, we start to work with the horizons. Once we have the horizon in the whole cube or in all the 2D lines, we're working with the anomalies. And we're going to see if those anomalies are geologically consistent. Once we have that, when you have that structural environment or structural or, or, or the positional environment, we are going to start to work with the spatial studies. And we are going to divide the spatial studies in five points. The first point is the feasibility analysis. The feasibility analysis is a question and an answer. The question is, can, is it possible to find in the seismic data what we see in, 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 in the logs can we transmit what we've seen in the logs in the second data? So to do that, we are going to work with the wells. And the, 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 the logs that we are going to use are some logs related to the second data. And something related to the second data are the velocities and the density. In other words, we are going to use the, density, the impedance. P impedance or S impedance. And suppose that we have in this access the P impedance and in this one the S impedance. We are going to get a cross plot. And from those cross plots we are going to have uh, clusters. Those clusters are represented in the logs. So that's the first step. So remind we have to remind the things. Then we continue working with the data. So we are going to work with the preconditioning data, with the velocity, with the ladders, with the seismic itself. Once we have that, we continue working with the inversion. So we're going to create the acoustic inversion, the elastic inversion, the AV analysis. We are going to generate some uh, attributes. And once we have that, we're starting to work with the cross plot. So now we have the cross plot, the P impedance and the S impedance. And this should be similar than the other. So if we have a good correlation between those, the feasibility analysis says that there are quite possibility that we can find in the same thing that we saw in the world. If, if this is correct, we can extrapolate that information in the whole thing. And normally this is the way that we are working in QI or uh, rock fixed analysis. But also we are going to, with that, with that information, we the, the, our geophysicist is very happy because he can find a geological model and he can 
have some answer about that geological model. But in the same time, appear some questions. And then our geophysicists is having doubts. And the question is, do we have enough experience in that area? Do we have enough knowledge in that area? Do we have enough geological information or geophysical information in that area? Do we have papers or report to use as support in that area? If we have all of that things, which is the best way to use it? But also, we can combine our interpretation with our geologic, uh, geophysical study, I'm sorry, with the petroleum in, uh, reservoir engineering data, and also with the geological risk characterization or drilling. Suppose that we drill a well, so we get information. So we have a lot of information around our area because we are very happy. We know the, the, the geological model, or we think that we know the geological model. And the next question is, how can we store that information? How can we store that experience? How can we put that experience in some place in order to use in the future, for us or for other people? Which is the best way to classify that information? And the best way is with the math. We found with IBM and Gulf here in, in Lisbon that the, the, the math is, is very useful. And we can combine artificial neural network or deep learning in terms of the, 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 uh, uh, the artificial intelligence or cluster and regression, natural language processing, image algorithms, um, similarity algorithms. And we can combine all of those in order to get the best idea of that knowledge, of that experience. And this is not, this is not new for us. Everybody knows but a, a telephone. We can do a lot of things. And our telephone is intelligent for me. I have a son. He's uh, 20 years old. Before he started the university, he studied in Spain. Before he started in his university, I took him a lot of pictures. And the system learned that he's Ivan. Ivan, my son, I took a lot of pictures and I put his name. This is Ivan. This is Ivan. This is Ivan. When he came, before the pandemic, he came with beard, with a long hair, thin, and I took a picture. And the system gave me the name, Ivan. And I thought, this is magic. And really, it is not magic. The system, the system keep the, the principal characteristic. One of the characteristics is distance between the eyes, shape of the mouth, shape of the nose, whatever some special characteristics of him. When he took the new picture, when he came, that characteristic continued. And the system says, there are 80% of probability that this is Ivan, and he put the name. Good, suppose that the system give me another name. The system give me Miguel. I said, this is not Miguel, this is Ivan. And then I train the system, and I put Ivan. Now the system knows not only the first characteristic, the distance is and the, and the shape of the mouth and the, the nose, but also incorporate a new knowledge, incorporate a new characteristics. Those characteristics now are new and the system learns. The next time that I take a picture, and I took a picture for him, the system will give me Ivan. And if Ivan shaves and put her hair and get fat, he will be Ivan as well, because the system will take the characteristic that they learned before. We can do the same thing with the seismic. Now, I'm going to show you this SFA. Uh, SFA is the, is, the, is, is, is the seismic facies analysis. It's the, the, the module that I told you that we are going to, to use in order to compare with the traditional way to interpret. But now we're going to see the data in another way. And we're going to interpret the data in another way. What we see here is a seismic line. It doesn't matter where. We don't see wells. We don't see horizons. The only thing that we can see here is a small window. And that small window we call small frame. Inside that small window, we're going to do all the calculations. We're going to train the system. And then we're going to classify the whole seismic cube. Great. 
what we see here is that small window. But each of these square is a small window calculated with different characteristics. The same characteristic that my son has. Distance between the eyes, shape of the nose and the mouth. But in this case, this, the, 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 these characteristics are here. In this algorithm, show me this amplitude very well. In this one, show me this amplitude as well, but also show me another amplitude. This one doesn't show me the amplitude there, but show me a very good amplitude here. In other words, if we can calculate different characteristics in that window, we can combine them, we can use, in this case, cluster analysis, and then we can say, okay, this cluster are coming from maybe this amplitude, this one, coming from this one, and this one, from this one. So, we can generate the cluster analysis in that small way, based on the characteristics. But anyway, someone can tell me, but there is no artificial intelligence here, yes. We don't have, at the moment, any related with artificial intelligence. The only thing that we have is we can separate each area based on computer vision analysis characteristics in different clusters. So I'm interested, I'm interested in this one, in these clusters. So I can turn off all of those and keep the cluster number five. The cluster number five is the red. Is this one. So let's see here. This is our cluster. Okay. Now we can ask to the system and then appear that the artificial intelligence. We can ask the system. Can you give me some suggestion about this cluster based on computer vision analysis from another area or similar area than here? But also, can you give me or can you suggest what kind of lithology you can give me based on your computer vision analysis and based on your knowledge base? So the system is going to retrieve this. What we see here are all the characteristics that the system calculated. We saw in a blue, in a, this, 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 we, have, we, we are seeing blue and, and violet. The blue are the characteristics calculated from the computer vision. And the violet are coming from the knowledge base. Because someone before, in another moment, or in a similar area, says the shapes have the same, these characteristics. And, okay, okay, wonderful. That's according with the knowledge base, and you see here it's violet, according with the knowledge base, those are shapes. I'm very happy because I know those are shapes, but I'm going to share with, with, with my colleagues. And then I'm going to prepare a peer review. I'm going to show this to my, to, I'm going to have a meeting with a review, I'm going to discuss with my colleagues, and my colleague says, okay, everybody agree. Everybody says, this is shape. And then, at the moment that they're going to close this, and I put this in the knowledge base, and says, okay, this cluster files are shapes, someone with a lot of experience says, be careful. I agree with that. Those are shapes. But, I was working in a similar area, very near to this one, and I thought that it's not so bright, and this is another characteristic. And this bright is coming from the computer issue. So, everybody agree what well, this is not so bright. This is a half bright, 50% bright, to say something. So we can train the system and say, okay, in this area, it's not so bright, it's 25%. So we are going to say this less right than the other area. Okay, this is the beard, it's the long hair. So we are going to incorporate to our knowledge database, not only the computer vision characteristic from the very beginning, but also 
the small change that we have in the computer vision in our area. So the system now knows that the, not only we can find shades with a 50% bright, but also with a 25% bright. So the system is learning. We train the system. Here is the moment that we are going to use the artificial neural network, deep learning, machine learning, all of that things. And I'm not going to talk about that because everybody knows about that and knows how it works because as I mentioned before, we have it in the, in the normal life. Okay, once I have that, I have to do with all the clusters. And then I have to train all the clusters. Here we have shade one, so it's, it's this one, and look at this. This is another cluster, and these clusters are suns. In the reality, when I was working on this, because I prepared this for this moment of end day project, the system bring me suns, and those are suns. So I was very happy to, to present this, because the system found the suns. So I'm going to expect that the system found in the whole cube Anomalies like this, suns. These are carbonates, and the system gives me carbonate. Another one, these are shades, and I have to train, I remain that I have to train. These shades are the ones that I showed you before, and these are very important because in our case, these shades are different than this one and this one. Those shades are the soft rock, and those are another kind of uh, uh, lithologies, volcanics and carbonates. Okay, having this, we are going to extrapolate everything in the in the 2D line. First, I was I would like to show you this in order to show you how good the system can uh, 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 realize where we have different lithologies. In this case the, the uh, carbonates. And now we did this in the in the in the whole in the 2D line, just in that area. I can generate another area and tell to the system, please classify what we saw in the small window based on computer vision, based on the characteristic or the task template that I use in the small window in the whole 2D line. And the system will give me all of this. Look at this. The system can see that those are suns, these are suns. We can see perfectly well the covering. We can still see the, 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 our, our soft rock. And that was very happy to me. That is, to me, it was very, very nice. Then we can do it in the whole 3D. And our geophysicists or, or geo, geoscientists are very happy because everybody is happy because we have a lot of peer reviews. We can share with the peer reviews our knowledge and we can incorporate our knowledge in the knowledge database. Then I'm going to, to show this to another peer review. And someone says, okay, this is beautiful, this is wonderful. But I, want, I would like to compare what you did with the traditional interpretation, the traditional way to interpret this. Okay, so we're, going to, we're going to compare. This is the traditional way to interpret. And this is our methodology. You see, uh, or it's a fake. The ones what we did with IBM. Can you see perfectly well here the carbonates, shales, our salt rock, and here, the suns, the same sun that we have there. In gray, we have the shades. But where this line of this plot coming from? It's coming from this interpretation. And this is, is the result of the elastic impedance, elastic inversion. When you run the elastic inversion, we run not only the, the impedance and the impedance and the density, but also run the Young modulus and the Poisson ratio. And why Young modulus and Poisson ratio? 
because when we did the feasibility analysis, we found that the young model of sample sum ratio can separate perfectly well, or we can interpret it better, this cross plot. So, we did an interpretation of this cross plot. And we found that these are the, carbon the carbonates, and these are the shells, the ones that are very interesting to me, and these are the sands, and those are the other shells. But there is something interesting here. If we take out these polygons, we're going to see a lot of points. So, we need to incorporate knowledge to, to, to separate or to generate these polygons. We need to incorporate our knowledge, we need to incorporate papers, or we need to incorporate information in order to separate this. Because if I take out this polygon, as I mentioned before, and I put everything with the same color, we cannot see any separation. This is, this is an interpretation. And if we are doing in this way, great, it's a great job, it's something very, very important. But the knowledge is not there. And we cannot so store that knowledge. With this, we can store our knowledge. And we compare with other areas. And then we can not only compare, we can pass our knowledge to other people. Suppose I am living here. And, and I'm, I am the only one who's working here in, in, in this area. Someone who's coming, he has to study, he has to see everything, he has to see the report. But that system gives the possibility to, to store not only the information, not only the knowledge, not only the experience, but also papers related to this area report related to this area. So, according with that, and to finalize, I have some conclusions. The combination of artificial intelligence algorithm with computer vision algorithms make possible another approach for safe metadata interpretation. This is another approach. This is another tool. And this is something that could be a complement, that could complement our traditional way. The computer vision analysis become part of the physical interpretation. Why I'm saying that? At the moment that I can separate the task template or the characteristic, that four square that I showed you before with different algorithms, I'm putting there my interpretation because I'm choosing those characteristics and I can, I can reject another one because I have a feeling, or I know the geological model in order to incorporate that task template or those characteristics. Why? Because I need to generate the best cluster or the best cluster solution that I can. The knowledge database is continually corrected and updated by incorporating information from the interpreters. And this is the peer review analysis. All we need to work with our colleagues, with the geologists, with the geophysicists, with the engineering, with the petrophysics, always. Because we are incorporating knowledge, and that knowledge is going to be in our house, and that knowledge is going to be with us. The process could be done three times faster than the traditional methodology. And this is very important. Why is important? Because we can do fast always that we are working with the system. Why? We need to train the system. We need to work with the data. If we don't train the system, if we don't work with the data, the knowledge data rate is not fit and we cannot use it. It's like a car. We can have a Ferrari without gas and the Ferrari is not working. It's stopped. So it's important to train the system. It's important to work with the system. And as much we train the system, as faster the system is. This workflow allows the knowledge incorporation as a knowledge digitalization process. We save the knowledge and pass it to other interpreters working in different areas. So I incorporate this knowledge digitalization process because this is what I want. I want that all of our knowledge incorporated in the, in the knowledge database. And the company who has a lot of knowledge, and the person who has a lot of knowledge, has a lot of value. 
them. This is very important. And I think one of the important things nowadays is the knowledge. We need to order our knowledge. We need to put our knowledge in a safe place. And we need to study a lot in order to incorporate in our knowledge database. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio. Thanks very much for your presentation. Really nice one. Uh, so, we don't have uh, questions for here, for now, but I have uh, one or two here uh, with me. Um, so, first is uh, what you think or what is your opinion about the, this software or this, this um, I don't know if it's a software already or not, uh, if it can be implemented only in the first phase of exploration, so when we are in the beginning of the project, uh, to do a screen, or uh, um, do you think it can, uh, it, it's useful for, for, other, for the other steps of, uh, yes. of yeah, our the, work? The, the software is working, the, we, we are doing a lot of, a lot of uh, training right now, we are using what we call the alpha tester, are people from, from our company working in the in, in the software, doing, doing experience, uh, filling the database. And with this software, we can work with from the very beginning, from, from, from exploration or new ventures. And also we can work with, the, uh, with um, not only with exploration, but also with the development. And uh, this is another step. So with that step, we, we are going to work with the WALS. And PPC, Physical Property Characterization, include the WALS and include more interpretation. So the software is working not only in exploration, but also in development. And then with the SFA and PPC, we're going to incorporate all of that knowledge in GRA, the geological risk assessment. And we can characterize our risk with different areas and incorporate new areas in order to characterize those new areas with the ones that we have right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, so you say that the, the process could be done three times faster. Um, it's it's uh, related to the only inversions or like seismic inversions or all the process? No, I, 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 when the I, I process. Three, three, three times faster is related with from, 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 from the, from the um, feasibility analysis. Okay through the um, interpretation of the cross plot for the for the elastic inversion so the three times faster is what what i show you in the in the last um, slide with the comparison okay. all the process in order to compare both uh, okay. sometimes it's two, two and a half sometimes it's four times faster but it's around that this is a, an average Dep depend of the data if we have, this is a very very nice data. If you have very bad data, we need to work more carefully with the tax template or the characterization, the the, 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 the force, uh, the four uh, window that I show you, the four uh, algorithm that I show you. So if the data is bad, we need to be more careful with that. Um, we have we have to be very very careful when we choose the tax template. Because if the tax and place are wrong, as I mentioned before, uh, we are going to get the wrong um, clusters. But normally, uh, we use 20 or 25 tax template, so that's uh, good enough for a lot of information, a lot of data, in order to have a very good clustering. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for another one. Uh, the example that you have shown, uh, it's it's like silicy classics, right? Environment. Did you test yes, already yeah. with other environments? Yes, it's, uh, we can find suns, we can find uh, 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 shales, but also carbonates and, and, uh, and um, volcanics um, features. Okay. Um, regarding the inputs that uh, we need to, to have for the, so it's the, no, the knowledge base? Right, that it's being filled uh, and training all the time, uh, and the seismic we can use another another attribute. So yes, we can incorporate external attributes. In okay. maybe we can use the impedance, we can use the intercept and gradient, and uh, 
uh, we can use uh, another kind of attribute. And the system calculates attributes as well when we use PPC. And also those um, PPC is physical property characterization. We are going to use this input for PPC and then PPC calculate other, another attribute. We can incorporate other attributes, external attributes, and then we can go back to SFA and redo everything again. Okay. Other thing that we did, which is very important, and thank you very much for the question, Teresa. Mm -hmm. uh, with PPC, we, we could generate the low frequency model. So what that we don't have a very we don't have wells. We don't have wells in the area. So we can, from the knowledge database, we can generate the low frequency model in PPC and then going back to the SFA yeah, and everything again. Okay. Or in really nice. in a in a in a in a any 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 other software for inversion, like the, the low frequency model as an input for inversion. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Sergio. It was really nice, really nice presentation. Thank you Thank for you being much. here to, to present us this. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed the, the presentation and um, have a nice day and keep safe. Thank you very so, much. Thank you. We have finished the second day of presentations in the room number four of the Seven Gap Open Day. We would like to thank you all for attending the event and for the interesting presentations and questions. It will be a, pro a pleasure to have you here tomorrow at 2 p.m. Lisbon time on room number one for the debate economic impact and outlook on oil and gas sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.